All right. <clears throat> so this is Dr. Morton, um, <clears throat> and I'm recording uh, a, uh, a a partial redo of the uh, the lecture number three, and I may do a partial redo of four as well, uh, because I know there were resolution problems, and I I want to go through uh, how to write a program. The first part of that of lecture three. Uh, that's already on the blackboard it is pretty good and it's where I go over the features of the Viva board uh, you should definitely watch that but when I start working on the software and it's a little hard to see it because of the resolution uh, then that's where this one's going to pick up in addition um, make sure that you uh, so the resolution on this one I think is 480 and the other one was like 320 and 320 is just not good enough if you turn the resolution way up uh, and there's a limit to what OBS will do, but then you then you can't then it's hard to upload the videos and it becomes real difficult. I I don't know. I might try one at real high resolution, but I know it, it already takes about uh, 45 minutes to uh, to upload and process um, you know an hour of video on YouTube. So and at the higher resolutions, I'm sure that time goes up and up and up. Anyway, uh, so I, 480 seems to be uh, sufficient. Starting with, I think, uh, video 10 or 11, uh, the resolution is at 480, uh, and so from then on out, you can pretty well read the screens. And also, I became a little more sensitized to the fact that that uh, the screens were not readable uh, when they're when they're small. So I started blowing up the fonts and stuff. But anyway, um, so so I under, but I understand the frustration when you can't read it. So I'm going to go back through that. So let me let me just. Uh, uh, shrink myself down here and I'm gonna go uh, and then I'm gonna go ahead and bring up the IDE and let's see that wasn't what I wanted to do um, hang on I'm just gonna pause this till I get it all set okay so here's the uh, IDE and I'll try and leave it so that you can actually see me down here I'm gonna move this a little bit uh, so, uh, yeah, I'll try and make this so it works a little better. And still, the problem is if you click on this, it takes precedence. All right, so anyway, uh, the first thing you do is you want to you wanna create a new project. And so you go up here to File, and you click New Project. And you get this menu. And, uh, and again, I'm using... Uh, Ooh, let's see. Well, maybe this will be a good illustration. So I'm using MPLAB 5.40. So let me show you the difference. And and uh, this is the latest version, but that's not. This is not the version we're going to use. But I want to show you why we're not going to use it. All right. So yeah. Any okay. So anyway. So standalone project, and then we click next. And then here we put in, we select the tool. Now I'm using I'm using an ICD3, which uh, is not showing up for some strange reason, which is ridiculous, because it is available. Show all. Okay, now it's going to show up because it found it. I don't know why it didn't know it was there because it was there. No, this is great. All right, well, fine, I'm just going to leave it at no tool. I don't know what's going on. Uh, this is why we're not using this, by the way, one of the main reasons. Okay, then you have a compiler tool chain, and uh, we don't even have any compilers. I mean, it's ridiculous. Yet. Yeah, I haven't loaded XC8 in here, I guess. Um, anyway, the problem is, and, and I don't know what Microchip was thinking. I still don't understand it. I need to, I need to call up Dave and ask him about this. Uh, but... They they took out of this the option to select the uh, MPASM for your tool chain. Uh, so if you're using this, you're going to have a very difficult time doing the assembly language labs. Now, what you're supposed to load up is the version right before this, and the version before this is uh, is uh, instead of 5.40, it's 5.35. So let me kill this. And let me bring up that. And I actually have, 
I think I have 5.25, but it's effectively the same. Again, I put the link uh, for the archive so you can actually go back and load up any uh, version of the old MP Lab and now the MP Lab X uh, integrated development environment. All, all of the versions are still on uh, the Microchip website in their archive. And I put the link up in one of my emails and I'll, I'll make sure it's on the on Blackboard as well. So you shouldn't, shouldn't have any trouble. All right, so it comes up and here's what it looks like. And I'm gonna, let's see, I'm gonna shrink it down a little bit. Well, okay, it didn't do this. Okay, let me pause it until I get this set up. Okay, now here, I'm going to close these down so I don't have anything distracting me here. Okay, and you can see I have a few more projects in here than the other one. Okay, I'm going to start a new project. And so we'll go here, new project. And I have an initial setting in here called 32-bit MP Lab Harmony 3D Project. But I'm, I'm not going to worry about that. I'm just going to use this standalone project. You won't have this unless you load specifically load this in. And that's for working with uh, their 32-bit chips. Next, now, now we picked a device, but we don't have to select the programmer. And I'm just going to type in PIC 16F1829. And then I'll click on it. And just so you notice here, there's also a PIC 16F1829 LIN. That's a, uh, that's a chip specifically for automobile use, and the LIN is, a, is a, one of the typical uh, uh, bus configurations that's used in automobiles where the chips all talk to each other. You probably didn't realize that all the chips in your automobile, and you probably have 25, 30, 35 chips, microprocessors running in your automobile, all of them talk to each other. And that's one of the reasons why security is really an issue when we start going into self-driving cars because somebody can go in and and uh, and you know make a hard right turn on your on your steering wheel and crash you into something. So <clears throat> so there there so we, we we can't be we can't have auto uh, auto drive vehicles without pretty good security. All right, this is about headers. Uh, and headers are a special chip, and I'll talk about it later in the course, that allows you to, uh, to use uh, all the pins on a chip and still have your debug features. Currently, we have to give up RA0 and RA1 and the master clear pin in order to use our uh, programmer debugger, the SNAP. And if, uh, if we really wanted to use those pins for other stuff, then uh, we can do that, but we can't be debugging at the same time we're using them for other things. But if you buy one of these headers, then you can do that. And uh, the header is a special uh, special uh, uh, chip where they brought those extra features out through different pins than the RE0, RE1, and um, RE4 pins, uh, or RE3 pins rather. They, they bring them out through separate pins, and they actually add some pins to the, to the footprint so that you can have your debug, uh, your program debug uh, pins separate from the actual pins on the chip, and uh, and so these special headers you can purchase and you can you can use these uh, to debug a, a device when you when you want to be able to be using the debugger at the same time you're using RA0 and RA1 and uh, and RA3 for other things, so it's kind of a nice feature. Uh, I bought one, but I've actually never used it. Okay, there's my programmer, the ICD4. The snap would show up down here, and you'd click that. If you, if, if you do not see a serial number underneath your programmer, then it means that the IDE hasn't recognized it. So here, there's no snap plugged in, so the IDE isn't recognizing it. Um, but if, you, if it's recognizing it, you'll see a serial number. And if you see a serial number, you know that for most purposes, the, 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 the operating system and the, pro, and the integrated development environment sees your programmer and it should be workable. And usually if it sees the, if it sees the serial number, it usually means the programmer is fine. Although I guess it 
could be a problem still, but generally that would be really rare. All right, we'll click next. Now, notice I get I get a couple of choices. I get an, a C programmer using XC8, and I also get an MPASM choice. This is the assembly language, uh, uh, well, assembler, and this is the XC8 compiler. We use the word compiler when we're talking about uh, any language higher level than assembly. When we talk about assembly language, we, we talk about an assembler. And the difference is pretty significant. The compiler has to translate your C code into assembly language code, and then the assembly language compiler, uh, the assembly language uh, assembler, assembles your, your assembly language code into a, 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 a bit file. And then that bit file is actually loaded. <clears throat> but when you when you compile from C code into assembly language, there's a translation of your C instructions into some number of assembly language instructions. And uh, there could be, like in a for loop, uh, maybe if you're using C++ and you declare the variable within the for loop and all that, uh, there's a number of steps <clears throat> that would have to be taken in assembly language to make that happen. Well, so when it's compiled, then it compiles all those necessary steps, and then uh, and then when it's assembled, though, totally different. The assembly language routine takes each assembly language instruction and turns it directly into a single assembly a a simple machine language instruction. The only difference between an assembly language instruction and a machine language instruction is that the assembly language instruction uses mnemonics or essentially English abbreviations for the various operation codes and the various variables and registers that you're that you're working with but in in a sim, in a machine language everything is turned into numbers hex hex numbers and that's what of course goes into the uh, into the the flash memory of your pick part the actual numbers and and so that's what the all the assembler does is assemble it does a few other things it can link in additional object modules and and it can maintain libraries and it can and it can have macros and there's all sorts of things it can do uh, that are helpful but in the end every single assembly language instruction gets translated into uh, a single machine language instruction of course with macros uh, then you're abbreviating uh, maybe five or six or more assembly language instructions uh, with a single macro instruction and that's that's sort of a that's sort of the first step towards a higher level language I guess you could say and most most fancy assembly languages allow that too and then most C languages uh, allow you to do what's called inline assembly so you can have be writing your C program in C code and then you can you can right in the middle insert assembly language instructions uh, now you have to obey the rules when you do that, and they're they're pretty strict rules about what variables you can change and what you can't change, and what you can use and what you can't use. But as long as you follow those rules, it, it should work fine. And and then the uh, compiler compiles your C language instructions into some number of assembly language instructions. But your assembly language instructions that are in line, it just copies directly. Okay. Uh, so anyway, so here we are. And I'm going to select MPASM because we're going to do assembly language. Once we finish about the first four or five labs, then we're going to switch to C, and then you'll be selecting XC8. Now, notice I have 2.2, 2.1, and 1.45. I want you to use 1.45. And just like I also want you to use, uh, I don't want you to use 5.4 for the MPLAB IDE. I want you to use at least 5.35 or earlier. 5.25 is fine. There's only m minor changes, but when they went out with 4.0, they made quite a few changes in it, and it did really, uh, but they took away the assembly language option. Now, I think you can add it back, uh, and uh, there's some instructions on, I think, how to do that. I haven't done that yet, and there's there's really no reason to, to go through that at this point. Uh, probably in a coming semester, I'll, I'll make the adjustment, we'll make the switch, but I, I don't want you to have to do that because it, it's just going to make it more complicated to add that back in. And since I haven't even done it, I'm not even sure how well that works yet. Um, 
And also, the machines in the lab aren't set up that way. They're already set up with, uh, I think, the ones in the lab are 5.35, I believe. Um, okay, if you go back too far, like, like before version 5, you'll get to a version where before they came out with a snap, and it, the snap won't even be a, an option. You won't be able to use your snap. So, so you have to use a, the, essentially what I call the pen ultimate. So the ultimate version is 5.4. The pen ultimate is 5.35. Okay, so I'm going to select MPASM and next, and then I'm going to give the project a name, and I'm going to I'm going to call it uh, call it first first S21 first program for S21, uh, and I'll I'll say it's um, underscore and B L I N K. We'll do a little blank program. Okay, and I you you don't want to have spaces in these names. Uh, it's kind of a little bit of a quirk, but uh, so take out all the spaces. Underscores are okay, uh, and you don't want to have the number of characters be all that big. So I think maybe I'm going to change this to B uh, B I. Uh, maybe I'll just put it here. B. Uh, All right, so then uh, down here we have some other choices. Set as main project, yes, that's what we want. And that's, that's, so what you can do is you can create modules and then you can link them all together at the end. But we're not gonna do that, we're just gonna put it all in one program. And then this encoding, this is, uh, this is uh, th essentially how you want your, uh, your characters to appear. And the ISO 8859-1 is, uh, is American. So American English, so that's what we're going to select. It's basically ASCII. Okay, now, so now this is what we get. We get all this, and uh, I think you should be able to see this. But let me, let me. I may turn on the magnifier. Just let me just pause this a second. Okay, I'm going to see if I can um, use the magnifier key here. Yeah, so if we look at this magnified, you should be able to read this quite easily now. And what, what we'll see, we have several uh, things created here. There are all total six of them. Header files, important files, linker files, source files, libraries, and loadables. All right, so what I'm really interested, for the most part, in the early going, we're going to primarily deal with source files. And uh, we're going to click this, and you'll notice that it's empty. So what I do is I right click on it and I click new and I go over here to uh, to pick 8b simple.asm and so that's probably the easiest thing to do so I do that and then I get this so it wants a file name and I'm going to I'm going to give it a new file name so we'll just call it um, um, Example S21. Hey, maybe. All right. And what's nice is then it's going to create a file in your working directory, which is in my case MP Lab Projects, and it's going to call it uh, first uh, first uh, S21 blank dot uh, X. Uh, well, that'll be the directory, and then this will be the uh, this will be the uh, it'll put this assembly language file in there, and it'll. So all, all the stuff related to this program will be in this directory, which is kind of nice. And, and that happens automatically, and I think there's a little selection box down at the bottom. Uh, no, that's good. So anyway, we'll say finish. Okay, and then that's going to happen. And let me go back to then, uh, let me go back to here. All right, so now that's going to bring this up. Now you should be able to read this. And... And so what happens is this is my this is my shell file, and I'm going to get rid of all this other stuff here. Okay, so here we are, and I'll even get rid of the start page. All right, so now we have this, and um, and so you'll notice there are some features in here that you should be familiar with. First off, there 
there, there's a thing called the reset vector. When you hit the reset button, uh, when you have the jumper selected for reset function and you hit the little push button, then the, uh, the, wherever, the, wherever the program is executing, it immediately jumps to, memory, to program memory location 0000. And at that location, we should put uh, a go to instruction to the label where our code actually begins. And by convention, we call that start. So go to start. And start then is here. Remember, labels go and always start in column one, but nothing else except for comments should be in column one. Anything else should be out of column one, but labels should be there. All right. So, and then if you wanted to have interrupts, which we're going to have interrupts uh, soon, we'll put those uh, next. We'll put those in location, starting in location four. And that's because whenever you create an interrupt on this chip, execution uh, of the current instruction is finished, and then uh, control is transferred to the program instruction located at location four. And then that, that is your interrupt service routine, and your interrupt service routine then will run. When it returns, it goes back to wherever it was before and continues processing the code that it was doing when it got interrupted. All right, now we have... Uh, this is a linker instruction, and it just says main program code. So it's, it's going to start the main code here. And here is start, and then we just have a single instruction and then an end command. The single instruction is go to dollar sign. The dollar sign refers to the address of the current instruction, and you could do dollar sign minus one or dollar sign plus one or whatever it would jump additional instructions. But in this case, we're just going to do go to dollar sign, which means you're going to continually just execute the, this go to itself instruction. So that's not going to do anything. It's kind of like an, an infinite while loop that's that's one instruction long. All right. So so of course we want to replace this, and we'll do that in a minute. The first thing we want to do up here is we want to uh, we want to put in the configuration codes, as it says. Now, the best way to do that is to, is to use the, the automatic uh, generator for that. And um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into the window instruction, and I'm going to go down here to target memory views, and I'm going to go over to configuration bits and hit that. And now we're going to bring up this. Now I think I'm going to magnify this and see if we can see it a little better, although it'll probably run off the page. Uh, but yeah, so then now here here are all the configuration words, and we're just going to go through these. Uh, first off, and one of the very important things, we have to set the oscillator configuration to internal oscillator. So we hit the drop down arrow, and there we are, internal loss. So this is uh, external uh, uh, external clock high, medium, and low, internal oscillator, external RC clock, and then there's a high speed uh, and I uh, crystal I think and low power. I don't know. I'm not even sure what those are. Uh, I have to go back and look at it because I haven't used those lately. Uh, but you can, if you're not sure, you can look on them. Let's click and we'll see. Low power oscillator. Connected between OSC1 and OSC2 uh, pins. All right. <clears throat> you can't quite read it because it ran off the page. But um, but anyway, what we want is internal oscillator. And then it will actually tell you. Internal oscillator, I.O. function on clock pin. <clears throat> now, I'm going to show you this in a minute. There is a pin on every uh, one of these pick parts where you can bring out the internal oscillator clock. And... Uh, I'm going to do that and look at it on the oscilloscope so you can see it. And maybe I'll even do that in, in this lecture. I, I think I'd do it in another lecture, but maybe we'll do it today just for grins. All right. But if you if you select internal oscillator, then that clock pin uh, is going to have I.O. function, unless, of course, you select that. And that, that's another selection down here. All right. Now, watchdog timer. We don't want the watchdog timer on for this lab. We are going to use it for another lab, and we're going to use the software uh, software uh, determined uh, um, watchdog timer. Actually, it's software watchdog timer enabled. Uh, but we're just going to turn it off. 
if you don't turn it off, you're going to have a problem because uh, every few milliseconds your your uh, your watchdog timer will count down and reset your chip, which is a real pain when you're trying to run a program. Okay, power up timer, we're just going to leave that off. Master clear, we're going to leave on. Code protect and code protect data. These are these are settings that protect your your uh, intellectual property and try and keep other people from taking one of your chips uh, out of whatever pro product you put it in and then trying to figure out what your code is so they can just rip off your code and they don't have to do their own development. And this makes it harder, but it doesn't make it impossible. There are ways to get around it. Uh, but they involve things like grinding off the tops of the chip uh, bit by bit and knowing where to, uh, to disable this code protect feature maybe or something like that. Uh, but it's pretty good security. They have to be uh, very, very sophisticated, like a government, uh, in order to do this. Uh, brownout, reset, enable, on. So uh, we'll talk about this more, but this brownout feature is there so that when your battery runs down, if it's a battery-operated device, uh, as the voltage drops lower and lower and lower, eventually the voltage drops to the point where, uh, where it doesn't work, uh, where the chip won't work correctly. And when that happens, uh, some instructions might execute partially, and others, but uh, but uh, other parts of the instruction might not execute correctly. And what you could have then is unpredictable effects, and those effects could be very destructive. If say this is in a device controlling uh, powerful servos, all of a sudden the servos could start doing very bad things potentially. Uh, or, if, uh, or you could uh, you could overwrite your memory, or you could you could do all sorts of destructive things, and and so what this brownout does when you get to a certain voltage level uh, where the chip is still working properly, but the voltage is dropping, then it'll it'll power down the chip so that it stops working completely and doesn't and fails and and stops gracefully without any problems, as opposed to sort of uh, going through all sorts of spasms as the voltage peters out. So it's really good to uh, it's really good generally to enable this, but since we're going to be running uh, typically on fresh batteries or plugged into the to the wall, we don't have to worry about this. Clock out enable. This is where we can turn on uh, the uh, the clock out pin and uh, <clears throat> and actually look at the clock. And I think I'm going to do this so we can actually see the clock in a few minutes here. Then we have, and, and uh, I'll, I'll look and I'll tell you which pin that actually is. I don't, I never can remember off the top of my head. Uh, we have to look in the data sheet to find that. Okay. Um, and then we have the internal external switch over. And uh, this is for where you have an external clock, but it takes a while for it to get up to speed. And so you use the internal clock until the external clock's ready. And, and then uh, it switches over. Uh, also, I think it, uh, yeah, I don't know. And this fail-safe clock, so we're going to leave this off because we're not going to do that. And uh, here, fail-safe clock monitor, that's if you have an external clock and it fails, you can switch to an internal clock. Um, we're not going to use that since we're going to use an internal clock to begin with. And then this is flash memory self-write. So if you want to protect your chip from writing in your program memory area, uh, then you should leave this on. Uh, we don't care. We'll just leave it off because that's its default. But if you were doing this uh, to send it out in a remote environment where you wouldn't be able to get to the chip, and and it might, and and you wouldn't want some power glitch to cause it to to erase part of its program, this would be a good thing to turn on. Phase lock loop. This is uh, if you want to get to the maximum speed of the chip, you have to have this on. Uh, we're we're not going to use that speed. So we're gonna we're gonna leave this off, and then we have stack underflow, overflow underflow reset. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about this more. There's a hardware 16 level stack on this chip, and so if you have if you call 17 functions, if you call a function and it calls a function and it calls a function, and you go 17 levels deep, or you go 16 levels and then you get an interrupt, you're gonna overflow the stack, and uh, and so what happens then uh, is uh, you destroy your ability to recover. Uh, and and so it's a it's a big problem, and you can have it so it automatically resets the chip if you exceed the stack. Uh, probably a good idea. We'll leave it on. 
but we shouldn't, we're not going to get that deep on any of our calls. And this is our brownout voltage selector. There's a low point and a high point, and we'll just leave that as low. And then the low voltage programming. Very important point. So pay attention, listen to this. You, for your, your SNAP programmer uses low voltage programming. A lot of the other programmers that Microchip makes use can use low voltage programming or high voltage programming. And in the old days, there were some reasons for leaving this bit off. And, and in all my, uh, until we switched to the SNAP, we always turn this bit off. And it's taken a while, but I think I've finally gotten most of the old code eliminated so that so that none of the header files have low voltage programming off in them. But just check. Every time you load a program, make sure that the low voltage programming uh, is turned on, is enabled. Because your SNAP will program this bit to off, but once it does that, your SNAP won't work anymore, so you can't program the bit back to on. You have to go find another programmer like a PicKit 3 or an ICD3 or an ICD4 or or, or the, uh, the, the, the PM3 or whatever it is. There's a whole bunch of different things you can use, but uh, it's not a good idea to use it. Uh, it's not, it's, it's, you don't want to have to do that because you, you probably won't have one of these handy. If you're in lab, we have one in lab and inevitably somebody does this and we'll switch it back on. But if you're at home in Austin and you don't want to come to lab, be very careful you don't accidentally do this because that, that will render your snap useless until you get this bit flipped back on. Now, once, it's, once you flip it back on, your snap will work fine again. But, but your snap can program it to off, but it can't program it back on because it can't program it anymore after that. Okay, so keep it in mind. All right, now, we're, so we're going to leave all this just like this. And so the ones you have to change is your internal oscillator, the watchdog timer, the clock out should stay off, but I'm putting it on for this special demonstration. And then your internal, external switchover and fail safe should be off. All right, now I'm going to hit this button, generate source code to output. And I'm going to do that, and it's going to generate. And here are, here are the, uh, here's the code that I want to paste into my program. Now I'm going to go back out of the, my magnifier, and I'm going to go down here and I'm going to click on this. And I'm also going to include this PIC 16, uh, this 16F1829.inc file. So I'll copy this, Control C, and then I'll go up and I'll paste it in here. And, and it also brings with it this include file, which you need. Okay. Now, when you run a C program, you're going to do exactly the same thing. The only difference is, and I'll put my face back in here because it'll work now. Uh, oops. Do my face. Okay, what's the deal? Okay. For some reason it's messing up. Um. Well, I don't know. I swear. Let me turn this off. And bring this back in. I don't know. Okay, I'll pause it until I get this fixed. Okay, I, I don't know why this thing messes up. Um, it works great, but then sometimes it stops working correctly. All right, um, <clears throat> so here's what it looks like. Now, now we have to write a little bit of code. Now there's several things we have to do, and I'm gonna, I'm going to cheat a little bit because uh, I I I would probably have to look some things up if I did. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to bring up this, and uh, this source file over here, and oh, it's the same thing. Okay, well. Okay, let me pause it till I get to... Okay, so here's a program I wrote before, I guess in the fall of 16 maybe. And uh, so I'm going to uh, steal some of the stuff from this just so I don't have to reinvent the wheel. All right, now uh, sometimes we'll put in org4 and return from interrupt enable because this is where interrupts would go. Uh, we're, 
we're not going to worry about this this time because we're not going to use interrupt so we shouldn't have any interrupt so it's fine and we're going to have start uh, then we're going to the first thing we're going to do is we're going to set up the oscillator and we'll let the oscillator run and I and then I'm going to show you on the oscilloscope what it looks like now whenever we want to uh, whenever we want to uh, to uh, see a register, use a register. We have to do we have to do a couple things. First, we have to put the address of the register we want to use. We have to put that address in the instruction. Uh, and so the address of the register we're interested in using this time, well, the register we're interested in is OSCON. Now, now I don't know off the top of my head where that register is. I, I, I can find it, and in fact, I can bring up a memory view. I don't know why my camera is flashing like that. Uh, but if I go into memory, and I go down to uh, to target memory views, and I go into file registers, special function registers, that's what I want. So I'll see all the special function registers, and here they are right here. And I probably have to expand them so you can see them. Here are all the special function registers. And if I scroll down, I will actually eventually find them. Um, and okay, here is OSCON. And its actual address is 099 hex. Now, this is a 12 bit address. Of those 12 bits, 7 bits are going to be embedded in the instruction. And 5 bits are going to be in the bank select register because the memory is divided up into banks and uh, and there are uh, potentially 32 banks of special function registers and memory but uh, but they're not all implemented on our chip so here's where OSCON actually is but I don't need to know that fortunately uh, I I can just write the word OSCON and the reason I can do that is because up here in this uh, include file there is a entry in that include file that says OSCON equals 099 hex so whenever whenever it sees OSCON it it goes up and to the include file and substitutes in the actual value that's in the include file for, for this particular chip, the PIC 16F 1829, it's 99 hex, but it might not be there on a different PIC chip. And that's why you want to put in the right include file, which automatically then updates it to all the correct things for this chip. If we switch chips, we'd have to put in a different include file, but we could leave the code, in most cases, we could leave the, the code similar. All right. So now, so that's how all the abbreviations, and it's not just OSCON, of course. Tris A, Port A, Tris B, Ansel B. All those, all those all those names are uh, are referenced in this include file, and that's how the assembler knows what numbers to put in there, and that's what makes this assembly language because we we can use names, and we don't have to use the actual numbers. Same with start. In this particular case, start start is going to be so arg4. This return from interrupt enable instruction is at location four, so start's actually going to have an address of five. But we write go to start. the The assembler will automatically put hex five in here for the start address, and so we don't have to remember that starts at five and put five in here. The assembler takes care of that for us. The other thing that's nice about the assembler is we do have to load the bank select register, the BSR, with the upper five bits of the address. And the assembler is really helpful. It takes the lower five bits of the address, in the case of the move instruction here, and puts them actually in this instruction. And it takes the upper five bits with the bank select, uh, uh, with this bank cell compiler directive, and puts them in the bank select register. So the, the compiler, the, the assembler is doing some work for us. It's helping us. And uh, it's making our job a little easier when we write assembly code. Uh, but 
we know exactly what it's doing and and uh, we can determine and we don't even have to use this bank cell we can actually write the BSR instruction ourselves uh, let me just take a deviation here uh, and I'm gonna pull up the data sheet so let me do that in a second now here's here's when you type in pick 16 f 1829 search and you go to the microchip website this is what you get and this this gives you a bunch of stuff about this chip. Here are all the features, and it talks about this and that. Uh, but we're going to, we want to see the data sheet. So we click on that, goes down here, and then we want to get the, uh, the right data sheet, and it's right here. Uh, there's a product brief. We don't want that. We want the actual uh, whole data sheet. And so we click on this, and then we get the data sheet right here and uh, we'll blow this up and we can actually kill this well we'll blow it up a little more and if we do that then we can see all these features and what I want to do though I, I'm going to check two things because one I want to remember uh, which pin and I can never remember which pin Oops. Why is it doing this? Oh, okay. Why it's all blacked out? I have no idea. This is ridiculous. Okay, I don't know. Go, go figure. All right. So what I want to do is I want to look back here, um, and uh, yeah, I want to go to this table, uh, and you'll find yourself referring to this a lot. There, there are two of these tables. So this data sheet covers two different chips: the 1825 and the 1829, both the F and the LF. So there's four different chips actually. And they come in a whole bunch of different uh, diagrams. Uh, they come in PDIP, SOIC, TSSOP, and QFN and UQFN. And they have different pinouts. Uh, we, we are using the SOIC. Uh, so it's a surface mount chip. Uh, we used to use the PDIP, which was a, a through hole type chip that had that, that either put in a socket or went through hole. And this is the 1825, but we're going to switch to to the 1829. 20 pin diagram for PIC 16F or LF 1829. And we're going to use uh, we're going to use the SOIC which sort of looks like this. Uh, and you can see how the pins are arranged. They count 1 through 10 on this side and 11 through 20 up here. So at the top it's pin 1 which is VDD or high volt or, or your power and pin 20 which is VSS or ground. Okay, and then the pins we don't use are the RA0, which is the in-circuit serial uh, uh, port data line, and the, the in-circuit serial programmer clock, and then here's the master clear full and, and voltage programming. So they put a, for high voltage programming, you get a little extra pulse on here, but for low voltage programming, it doesn't do that, but it still is the master clear. And the master clear pin is used during debug features to stop the chip and single step it, some other things. All right, and to reset it. So these three pins are tied up with your programmer. The programmer also is connected to power and ground, just as is the chip. So five pins you can't use, 15 pins left. Um, all right, now here's the allocation table. You should become very familiar with this table. In fact, it'd probably be smart to print it out. Uh, I've never done that, I don't know why I should have, because I've certainly looked it up a million thousand times. Here are all the various features, and here, here are the, do, the different footprints. The 20 pin PDIP, SOIC, and SSOP, this is the column we use. We're not using the QFN or the UQFN, but in, in a future uh, Viva boards, we'll pro I probably will change to one of these pins, but, uh, but probably a different chip anyway. Okay, so here are all the lines RA0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, uh, 6, ra 5 rather. Uh, RA, where? I lost my brain here. RA5. Then RB4567, 
and RC 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and then power and ground. Those are all the pins. RA 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, RB 4, 5, 6, 7, and RC 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So the RC port has eight pins. The RB port only has four, and they're the upper four bits of that port. And the RA port has, uh, has six pins, RA 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. But remember, RA0 and 1 are tied up with the in-circuit serial programmer, and so is RA3. So the only functional pins you get in RA0, or, or in, in the port A, is port A2, RA2, RA4, and RA5. There is no RA6 or RA7. And then in port B, there's no RB0, RB1, RB2, or RB3, but there is 4, 5, 6, 7. Now why they did that, uh, yeah, I don't know. It is just what they did. Uh, it has to do with making it compatible with other parts in the same family. If we switch to a 40-pin chip, then we'll have port A, port B, port C, port D, and port E. Uh, but we're, but th that's probably what I'll do, maybe, for next fall. We'll see. All right, now, I did want to look and see where the clock out is. And it turns out, uh, so the clock out that where we can see the processor clock comes out RA4, so that's good to know. All right, so I turn that on, so the clock will be coming out RA4, and if I put a scope on that when we run this code, uh, we're gonna see the clock output. Okay, these are the other things that could be on that port. Analog three, uh, capacitive touch sensing three, uh, the timer one gate, uh, the timer one oscillator input, uh, the, uh, the B connection for uh, the uh, PWM pin 2 uh, or module 2 and then the uh, slave select 2 and the interrupt on change interrupt uh, is also available on that pin. Okay so the clock out is the RA4 so that's good to know and then the other thing um, let's see I already forgot what we were doing here um, oh um, yeah we wanted to see uh, we wanted to look, look at the bank, so let's do that. And I, I probably have covered this in another video, but since I'm doing this one, I'm a little fuzzy about which one's got what in it at this moment. Uh, where is mine? No, not that one. No. Here. Okay. All right. So here it is. And uh, so what we'll, what we do here then is uh, we want to go down to uh, memory organization, chapter three. And if we go through this, and we're going to spend more time on this later, but uh, what I want you to basically uh, talk about is there, there are in fact uh, three different memories on this chip, three different types of memory and three different memories. There is a flash EEPROM memory for the program. There is a static random access memory for, uh, for our data. And also in that same memory space, all the various registers that control pretty much everything on the chip are also placed. Uh, and then finally, there's, a, there's 256 bytes of electrically erasable, electrically programmable uh, EEPROM that's not flash, where you can uh, use have some 256 bytes of non-volatile data storage that will be saved even when you power the chip off. When you power it back on, the data will still be there, just like the program is still there. You could theoretically put this in program memory, but uh, but in program memory, it, it's a bit of a hassle to erase and rewrite a location. But in EEPROM, you can erase and rewrite every single location without any problem. Uh, so, so the, the EEPROM gives you a slight advantage there, uh, but it's only 256 bytes. All right, okay, so, so this is how program memory is arranged, um, and interestingly enough, uh, there are the configuration words uh, stuck in here someplace, uh, so, but if you keep scrolling down, then it'll show you how the data memory is organized. And remember, because this is a hardware chip, it has a separate data memory and a separate program memory. Let's see, I'll pop my face back in here. All right, so since it has a different data memory and program memory, 
uh, our data memory is organized totally differently than the program memory. Uh, we'll cover this more. I'm going to say it again and again, but the the data memory, <coughs> the data memory is organized in 8-bit bytes only. The program memory, all the words are 14-bit words. So it's not organized in 8-bit bytes, it's organized in 14-bit words. Every location is a 14-bit word. And that is because every machine language instruction or assembly language instruction in this chip is a 14-bit instruction, every single one. Now, that's not true of all microprocessors. Some microprocessors uh, can have various size program instructions. Uh, but this one has every instruction is 14 bits, which makes it kind of nice and uh, limiting in one way, nice in other ways. So here's how here's how the the program memory is set up. So every it's set up in banks. There are 32 banks, and every single bank is set up exactly the same way. The first 12 bytes are core registers. The next 20 bytes can be special function registers, and then the next 80 bytes our general purpose RAM, and then in the first bank, the upper 16 bytes are the same bytes as the upper 16 bytes in every other bank. So these are called common RAM. And so the nice thing about common RAM is, doesn't matter what bank you're in, you, you don't have to change the bank select register. You can just put in uh, the lower seven bits of the address and it'll be correct in every bank. But all the other random access memory locations, you have to be in the right bank and the right address. So all 12 bits has to be correct. But here, only the lower seven have to be correct. And so you don't have to set the, the, the bank select register. Okay, um, if you keep scrolling down, you'll see that all 32 banks are laid out here. Bank 0 through 6, 7 through 14, or sorry, 8 through 14, uh, what happened to 7? Oh, it's not on the page. Yes. Right. Bank 7, a bank 8 through 15, 16 through 23, and 24 through 31. There are all the banks. Now, you'll notice in the first uh, banks that we have lots of stuff going on. Notice we have 80, well, it says 96 bytes of general purpose RAM. That's right, because the upper 7 bytes are included. Here, we only have 80 bytes because the upper seven are the same as these. And they're the same here, and the same here, and the same here, and the same here. So you have 80 unique bytes, additional bytes in all these pages, 96 here, but it counts 16 up here that are then mapped all the way across. But the other 80 here are not mapped anywhere else, so they're 80 unique, 16 uh, common. And if you look, you'll see that goes all the way. So so bank 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and bank then uh, 8, 9, 10, and 11 uh, also, and finally bank 12. Bank 12 only has 48 banks, 48 right, general purpose uh, bytes, rather. Uh, so if you take, so that's, uh, so you take a, uh, 12 times 80 plus 46, 48, plus 16 in this upper, that should add up to 1,024. And that's, you have 1K of RAM on this chip. But notice the other registers. Now these 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 uh, core registers are, are the same in every single bank. Every single bank, the core registers are the same. But notice the special function registers here that that the first 12 are always the same, and then the next 20 can be different. and uh, and so if you look, uh, that takes us across uh, these banks. There are quite a few different ones here. Then there are fewer here. There's some more here. But then you get all the way to here. And look, there's only, only a few in bank 8. And then there's no special function registers besides the core registers in banks 9, 10, 11, 12, and so forth, all the way until you get to the very last bank. And then there's some special stuff going on here. Uh, and that's where you can actually get to the shadow registers. Uh, you can get to the 16 uh, the 16 byte hardware stack and some other things as well. Okay. So 
so if you look at OSCON, OSCON is right here. It's 099H. And so so the uh, so it's it's actual uh, that's its address. And if you break that up, uh, you'd find that uh, the upper five bits have to be a one, and the lower five bits have to be uh, uh, I guess since it's 99, you take away that upper bit, it would be 19. Yeah, 19. And and that's true for all these. And that's why we split the. That's why we have to put the bank number, the bank address, in the bank select register to get to the right bank. And then we have a seven-bit address within that bank for uh, the particular register we're interested in. And that particular register could be one of our core registers, one of our special function registers, or one of our general purpose random access registers, or one of our common uh, random access uh, registers. In this chip, we call everything a register. Uh, sometimes we call it memory locations. Uh, but in this one, they call everything a register. And that's just the nomenclature they chose to use. All right. So let me go back. See how we're doing on time here. Um, well, 56 minutes. So, boy, this... This camera is, I, I don't know if we have interference from some other program running, but um, this this locks up every now and then, and then every now and then it blinks black. It's really disturbing. Didn't used to do that, but now it is. Okay, so let me see if I can finish this up fairly quickly. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to I'm going to take a little bit of code from this one I already did, and I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you on the oscilloscope, the clock at least. So I'm going to set up the clock here. We're going to bank select the OSCON. We're going to load 6A into the uh, in, into W, and then we're going to move it to OSCON. And then uh, I'm going to also set up a port. Uh, uh, we're going to we're going to set up uh, port A bit five for output, and uh, and then and then we're going to uh, yeah. So we'll do that. So we'll what that should do is turn on the green LED. And so I'm going to take this code, I'll copy it, and then I'm just going to put it right over into this code. And then and then we'll leave this go to dollar sign instruction. So it's just going to go in a tight loop once it executes these instructions. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and download this to the chip. And I'm going to use this programmer. And then uh, I'll go ahead and switch this camera again. Oh, I turned it off. So that's why it doesn't show up. Okay, there's our there's our chip. And so then we're gonna click OK here and we're gonna program the chip. And you should see it. Should see it uh, start. Uh, you should see the green light come on. It won't blink because we didn't set up any blinking function. And I'm going to hook the, the oscilloscope up, and we're going to look at the. Uh, okay, so there's the light. It is programmed. You can see down here that it's programmed. Now sometimes this thing gets cloud compl uh, gets filled up with stuff down here. You get confused about what you're actually looking at. You can always right click and hit clear, and that's a, a good thing to do sometimes. All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and. Uh, Turn on the oscilloscope, and uh, let's see. Uh, hopefully, I can uh, do that. Yeah, I'll do that. Yeah, and we'll bring this down here. And okay, let me just pause this while I get this all set up. Okay, now you can see that uh, I have the uh, oscilloscope hooked up to RA4 because in the configuration word I uh, set it up for the clock to come out on that pin, and so you're looking at the, at the clock that the uh, that the chip is that the microprocessor chip is generating, and if we uh, if I get into you can see it a little bit better. Um, 
Let's see, I turned off the light, that'll help. And let's see if I can bring it in here nice and close. Oh, it's upside down. Now what? Be a little easier to read if it's not upside down. So we have, we see it's, it's a five volts peak to peak, and it's 99. Uh, well, nine 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 hundred and ninety eight point seven kilohertz, and then it jumps to exactly a megahertz, one megahertz. And the period is 1.001 to 1.002 microseconds. So, and since we're since we're running it, um, let's see if we get this set up here. And let's see, I think I need to do this like this. And turn the light back on. Okay, so you can see uh, that the clock's pretty good. It's it's uh it's within um, point 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 two percent or something like that. Uh, so it's pretty close. Varies a little bit. You can see it bouncing around the smidge. Um, but that's pretty good. All right, uh, let's see. So I'm going to Okay, so I, I'm going to let me just finish up and oh, I had a stupid light that kind of screwed up my thing here. All right, well, hopefully that uh, it is more legible and readable, but I didn't really talk about the programming much. So I'll probably redo, um, I'll probably add another video for lecture four and uh, I'll add some features to that and I'm going to go through and, and show you how to write these assembly language instructions. Writing assembly language code, it's tedious but it's very straightforward. Uh, you do have to understand though how the chip works and that's why I make you learn it. Because if you never learn assembly language you never really know how the chip works. If you do learn assembly language then you really do know how the chip works because you have to know that to write assembly language. Uh, and it turns out, although yes, this is just for the PIC 16F 1829, but almost every single microprocessor works in a very similar way. And although the instructions vary a little bit and, uh, and there certainly is some variety in addressing modes and a bunch of stuff, uh, if you know the assembly language code for one processor, you can figure out pretty much what's going on with all the others. So it's a it's a really good way to uh, get you um, introduced and and uh, and connected to the hardware, and that that's really the goal here. Uh, it the difference between a uh, an electrical engineer and a and a and a computer engineer and a uh, and a computer science student is a computer science student can write the code, but they have no idea what's going on under the hood. You, you need to be able to connect the wires to various things, interface these to all sorts of different devices. You need to know about voltage levels and frequencies and, and uh, impedance and, and uh, source and sync currents. You need to know a bunch of other stuff that they don't. And part of that involves understanding what's going on under the hood. Now they'll know about processor, they'll know about pipelining and cache hits and misses and things like that, and that's fine. But you're going to know about uh, how the ports are implemented uh, and just you, you really do need to understand uh, how the chip's actually working at, at down at the at the core register level. So, uh, and once you do that for one chip, it gives you insight into all the other chips that have ever been made. And yes, they're different in various ways, but they're also very similar. Every microprocessor I've ever seen has a program counter, every microprocessor has an instruction register, every microprocessor has address buses and data buses, uh, has stacks, uh, they all have very similar features. And, and even though they may differ in the size and, and uh, how many bits they are and things like that, they don't really differ in the basic fundamentals all that much. Okay, so we will, uh, we'll uh, I'll post this video and you can look at this in addition to the one that's already up.